Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ballet Ray. Welcome back to the box with your most trusted, very favorite ballet nerds on the internet. And today is your formal introduction to the different styles in ballet. If you've been around on our channel for any amount of time, you've probably heard us make a comment like, oh, the Balanchine this, oh, the classic Bournemouth that. And if you're sitting there wondering what is up with all of these ballet styles and why do they keep talking about it, then this is the video for you. Classical ballet is sort of the big umbrella term. Yes. But within classical ballet, we have a lot of different styles and also a lot of different training methods. And so they're kind of all coexist together in the big happy family of classical ballet. Each style has sort of its own little quirks, its own mm -hmm. personality. And so today we're gonna to be walking you through the differences between some of these styles, their main characteristics, some of the philosophies behind these training methods and styles, and some trademark steps that can help you identify them when you see them on stage. If you're ready to meet all the members of our little ballet friend group, then tap the like button and let's get going. So I guess the best place to start is to begin with the oldest member of the classical ballet friend group. And this is of course none other than the French training method, whose roots trace way, way, way back to 1661 in the courts of King Louis XIV. And I think it's pretty safe to say that this is the start of classical ballet. Yeah. It had its origins right there in the Academy Royale de Danse. Yeah. And from there it just, you know, kind of started taking off and it spread around the world. But yeah. this is like OG. The OG, OG ballet. <laughs> now of course that is not the kind of training method that the French method is today. The French method went through sort of a glow up in the 1980s by Rudolf Nureyev, who was a legendary danseur in those times. Obviously Nureyev did keep a lot of the principles of the training method, but he made it more applicable to nowadays ballet training in order for the dancers of that training method to keep up with modern standards. I think French dancers are very clean. We've said this before. French dancers are known for their very clean lines, very precise footwork. That is one of the principles and the kind of the key pillars of their training method and I think that they're most well known for is their clean lines and that technical cleanliness and purity and everything like that. Mm -hmm. It shows when they dance. Their arabesques are absolutely spotless. Square. Beautiful and square and pure and it's just exquisite. The French really prioritize that very royal and elegant look mm -hmm. in ballet and I really like it. It's not too flamboyant. It's not overdone. I, I feel like it kind of encapsulates the, the tradition yeah. of the original classical ballet, which was only performed ever in royal courts. It has that sort of demeanor and that sort of royalty vibe that yeah. the original classical ballet had. I think the French dancing, specifically their acting and their artistry, mm -hmm. is very nuanced. It's very subtle. It's not dramatic, mm -hmm. you know? It's very candid but in a very poised way it's very balletic kind of more subdued than most other i agree i would say I agree. most other most other styles mm -hmm. keeping yes. everything looking very balletic very poised very mm -hmm. polished in, in in terms of specific like technique things technique trademark things yeah i would say the french dancers they keep their port bras very forward compared yeah. to say vaganova or balanchine yeah. if you were to take your arms up to fifth they would be very much here and yeah. less like up. You know, they have that sort of forwardness. The arms are never behind the body. They're always placed mm -hmm. in a very perfect position. And yeah. even like their arabesque is never twisted and huge. It's very, it's, it's square. Elegant. Off. Which makes for a very, very classy approach to the dancing. We're probably all wondering where can we see some beautiful French ballet? Mm -hmm. Of course, the first place to go is the one, the only Paris Opera Ballet. Yes. They have a gorgeous, gorgeous company and all of their dancers really embody the French style in terms of the clean lines, the technical precision. There have been some famous French dancers over time and there still are today. Oh yes. Dorothy Gilbert's one of them. She's a beautiful dancer. So, so, so good. From the past, there's Lauren Hilaire, Elizabeth Patel, Aurélie mm -hmm. Dupont, Sylvie Guillaume as well. Yeah. So yeah, there have been so many beautiful, beautiful French dancers. I'm sure you can find some of them on YouTube. Highly recommend. I would say the French style in a nutshell is like your very classy, elegant, good example friend. She's a very diplomatic one, the one with perfect manners. Yeah. She probably wears, you know, silk shirt, kitten heels, and wears a nice perfume. Yes, that friend. You know? <laughs> That's sort of the vibe that the French style gives off for me. Definitely. It's always like, just put together. Always presentable. Always, always yes. nice. Always on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Our next friend in the ballet friend group, the Bourneville Method. You've heard us talk about Bourneville quite a few times on this channel, and I'm sure a lot of you have been able to kind of pick out that Bourneville is quite different stylistically than a lot of the other styles. It was created by Auguste Bourneville. He was actually very influenced by the French method. In fact, the Bourneville style is kind of like a little time capsule of what the original French style used to be. And as time went on, all the ballet styles kind of evolved and changed to fit the changing landscape of ballet. And then Bourneville was over here and went, you know what? We could also not do that. <laughs> <laughs> and what was interesting about the Bourneville style and the way he taught is that he assigned a specific class to each day of the week. Yes. So you'd have your Monday class, your Tuesday class, Wednesday class, etc., etc. Yes. And you'd repeat those exercises for every week. That way everything was very well rounded and you made sure you had like a balanced ballet diet. Exactly. Throughout the whole week. <laughs> yeah. Bordenville himself was a fabulous, fabulous dancer, had a beautiful career, and then when he took up teaching, he definitely put a lot of energy and a lot of focus into his male dancer proteges. Yeah. So that they would all eventually, hopefully, become as good as he was when they grew up. Bordenville technique really has the most challenging technique and it's very demanding specifically on the men. Yes. Because Bordenville was like, you know, I can do it. You have to do it. <laughs> the Bourneville male dancers are very, very, very technically strong. So strong. Incredible dancers. Yes. The trademark qualities of the Bourneville technique, I'd say, is just their lightness and their speed with particular skill and petite battery, which mm -hmm. is like those little jumps where you beat your legs and all the small things like that, which is very challenging to do, but this was like Bourneville's trademark it was his style. Thing. And it was his strength, a strength of his own, and so it became the strength of all of his students after. Him. Obviously, they really valued lightness and being yeah. able to jump without any apparent strain. Yes, the whole goal was to make all this incredibly hard stuff with your feet, but to make it look so effortless and so easy and yeah. so carefree on top. Some trademark Bourneville positions include this very inclined yeah. head, and a lot of other ballet styles were very upright. Whereas in Bourneville, he put the head down here. His purpose was to make the dancers appear very welcoming, very friendly, very open, and kind of very humble humble and approachable, and just like friendly, good vibes all exactly. around. <laughs> Obviously, the classic Born and Bill, very little use of the arms. Very little so, use of the arms. You know, you're doing like, jeté bantu, jeté bantu, breathe volé, and all that. And the arms are just like here, and maybe your eight palmons is like this. A little bit. Do, a little. Do, do. Definitely is a it's very so fantastical difficult. physical feat for any dancer to accomplish. And mm -hmm. it's, it's still it's still breathtaking in today's ballet scheme. In terms of the arms, Born and Bill's arm positions are generally very rounded compared to the other styles. In terms of the fifth en bas position, or the bras bas position, in most other ballet styles, the position is much longer, a mm. little bit more like an elongated oval shape. For Bourneville, the arms were shortened, it's a bit rounder, it's a little bit more circular. The same thing for his demi bras, or open first position, and for his demi second position, it was a, everything was a very, very rounded. Again, to portray that sort of soft and gentle and friendly picture. It kind of reflects one of Bourneville's philosophies that the feet are the rhythm and the arms are the melody. That was his sort of outlook on ballet and it really shows in his choreography and in yeah. his ballets. If I'm thinking about like flower fest. Yeah, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. The feet are the rhythm and the arms are the melody. Huh. <laughs> um, another classic Bourneville thing, this is mostly found in his ballets. Yes. <laughs> the Bourneville shoes, TL. These are shoes specifically for the men. Yes. They're the ones that are black, but then it has like the white point. that comes into a point at the toes. Obviously, we've never worn them, we're girls. Mm -hmm. But allegedly, they make you look sickled from the moon. <laughs> so. <laughs> so every time you, you do a Bourneville ballet, chances are you're a man. And you may have to pull out the Bourneville shoes and then really make sure that you're shaping your feet well because yeah. <laughs> all bets are off. <laughs> you're on your own. Again, going with the general Bourneville feel, the acting style is of course very relatable, very personable, and very realistic. It's nothing too theatrical. It's not overly dramatic. It's not super poised like yeah. the French school either. It looks very genuine. It looks very realistic. It kind of enhances the overall Bourneville charm of yeah. making it look very friendly and very relatable. Whimsical. Whimsical and full of life in that 
regard. Yes. Bourneville loved life, and yes. he wanted to portray that joy in the dancing. Yes. And it's very evident. All the ballets that he produced are very, like, very lighthearted. Just good vibe ballet. Yeah. You know, if you think of Napoli, mm -hmm. such a happy ending. Mm -hmm. Flower Fest is an adorable pas de deux. Yes. Even, like, the conservatoire. Oh. Most of his works were just, like, they're very happy. So, where do we find these amazing Bourneville ballets? Well, obviously, Bourneville was Danish, so the Royal Danish Ballet is a really great place to start. Mm -hmm. Their company is Bourneville trained and they also perform a lot of his ballets yes. to kind of keep that legacy on. Of course their dancers are more versatile and they don't just dance with their arms here. Yeah, they exactly. can do a lot of, they've done a beautiful Giselle production, but they do so, so well in the Bourneville Ballets. Their men are, the, oh my gosh, their men are yes. so, so, so strong. Do you want to talk like, solid double tour landing yeah. every single time. Oh my goodness. Some Bourneville trained dancers include Eric Brune, Nicolas Huba, and Johan Kabor. These are all famous mm -hmm. Bourneville trained dancers. I think to describe Bourneville the best, it would be your small bean friend. Bye. Golden retriever energy kind yeah. of friend. Full of whimsy, probably a little naive, very innocent, wholesome kind of person. Yes. Bourneville seems like the person that would just make friends in the most random places. Could be random walking people. down the street and then suddenly he's best friends with somebody like, oh my god, let me meet my new friend. How did you meet? We were on the crosswalk together. Now we're friends. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Alright. Alright. <laughs> that kind of friend. The yep. one that just loves on everybody. That's Bourne. That's the Bourne and Bull style. Now we're moving forward to the Cicchetti Method, founded by Enrico Cicchetti, who was an Italian danseur who became a teacher later on in his career. He might have been one of the greatest mm -hmm. in terms of teaching, in my opinion. And I feel like a lot of the current training styles do send from Cicchetti yeah. today. Cicchetti's fingerprint is everywhere. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he's literally everywhere. The ABT training, Bound Russian, school. RAD also. Yeah, and they all draw inspiration from, from Cicchetti. Cicchetti. Cicchetti was actually a very famous man. He trained a a lot of mm -hmm. famous dancers, including Anna Pavlova herself, yes, and Vaslav Nijinsky, like the I greats of then, were trained by Enrico Cicchetti. Yeah. And it was considered that you were not a fully trained dancer mm -hmm. unless you had finished your training with Cicchetti. That's how serious he was. <laughs> so Cicchetti's training method, he had a training method kind of similar to Bourneville in terms of he had his iconic days of the week system, which mm -hmm. was again, a Monday class, a Tuesday class, all the way up to a Saturday class. Mm -hmm. And then you just repeat those every single week. There were like six principles. He would have one principle focused on each day of the yeah. six days of the week, just to make sure the dancers were well-rounded and that no one would be imbalanced, that everyone would have mastered every single thing that there is to classical ballet. And his method includes some of the most difficult combinations and steps that Honestly, a lot of them aren't done anymore because they're too hard. Cicchetti really emphasized the importance of understanding ballet technique, which is yeah. partly why we really appreciate Cicchetti. It's perfect for the ballet nerd. It's perfect for the ballet nerd. The understanding was so important to him and he made sure that the dancers weren't just copying what yeah. they saw, you know, the greats doing. Yeah. And they actually understood the technique. And so they knew how all the concepts were supposed to work. They mm -hmm. had mastered all these different movements, all these different principles in yeah. classical ballet so that they would, for themselves, become a very well-rounded dancer. Cicchetti also valued each dancer as an individual. He didn't try to, like, put the technique as, like, a one-size-fits-all mold. He wanted the dancers to embrace their natural turnout, for instance, rather than trying to push for the 180-degree <sighs> turnout. In Cicchetti's mind, the health and well-being of the dancer was more important, yeah. so he wouldn't stress crazy, crazy amounts of stretching. He wouldn't emphasize a complete, perfect turnout. It was supposed to be a training to make the dancer as an individual the strongest and the best that they could be so that they could have a long and fulfilling career with as few injuries as possible. Some interesting trademark characteristics of the Cicchetti style is that he actually did not encourage his dancers to cross their fifth completely like toe to heel but he actually <laughs> said that the heel should line up with the toe joint the big toe joint and that still is a valid technique today like yeah. there are definitely dancers who don't overcross their fifth Cicchetti really encouraged complete coordination throughout the entire body yes <laughs> which honestly I feel like in order just to do a Cicchetti class you would need to have mastered coordination throughout the entire body or you wouldn't be able to make it <laughs> because Cicchetti exercises again yes. kind of going along with the coordination thing he never liked to have the wrists flick 
at the end of the movement. So if you're to take your arm to fifth, I'm gonna try and shrink down so you can see. You don't wanna, he doesn't want the flick at the end. He wanted everything to arrive together. So you don't have that afterthought. Oh yeah. All the transition had to be really smooth and seamless. And not just for the arms, I guess, but for all the transitions in general, it was supposed to be completely seamless. Another thing that they do with the Cicchetti method is the, the special frappe. The English style, you flex the foot, strike the floor, and then you do your frappe. The Russian style, you do it with a pointed foot and you don't really strike the floor. Mm -hmm. But the Cicchetti style is the hardest one, <laughs> of course. You have to do it from a sur le coup de pied position, which means the foot is wrapped around the ankle, strike the floor, and then do your frappe. It's difficult y'all it's, it's not it's, easy. it's not easy chiquetti all of chiquetti stuff is so so hard so where do we go and watch some beautiful chiquetti ballet now that we know that their dancers are some of the greats unlike the french style that has its kind of central hub which is the paris opera ballet or the vaganova russian style as you'll see in a minute they have like their own vaganova academy as its sort of home base chiquetti doesn't actually have this like there's no major chiquetti ballet school or chiquetti company where all the dancers are Cicchetti trained. Rather, like we said, Cicchetti's fingerprint is literally all over the ballet world. Mm -hmm. And there are many different Cicchetti teachers and Cicchetti dancers all over the world. Fun fact, actually, the founder of the Royal Ballet School was one of Cicchetti's students. And so when she founded the Royal Ballet School, it was very much a Cicchetti method-based school until 1986. Since then, they've kind of devised their own training method, like the Royal Ballet School training curriculum or something. Yeah. <laughs> but it still remains very much influenced by Cicchetti today. Pavlova, Valenci, Nijinsky, like obviously testaments of Cicchetti's greatness, Monica Mason. What can we say? They're all fabulous. Cicchetti is your non-judgmental nerd friend. Definitely. Cicchetti, I feel like, is that person that you can always go to for advice and yeah. knowing that they will, will not judge you and they'll just take you as you are and give you the best advice. Exactly. They're just the one that is friendly and welcoming to everyone. Very nerdy, very smart, very clever. Probably wears glasses, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's Chiquetti for you. Next up is probably the most popular and probably most adored, I say, style, style of all time. And this is, of course, the Vaganova method or the Russian training style. This was founded by Agrippina Vaganova, who was a Russian ballerina with the Marinsky Ballet back in 1916. She devised this training method, and it was kind of a combination of the elegant French style and the virtuosic Italian Cicchetti style. When you look at Vaganova and Cicchetti dancers, you can definitely see some similarities in mm -hmm. terms of the difficult combinations yes. and the sort of tricks that they are able to do. Yeah. Vaganova is considered the most, one of the most rigorous yeah. training methods. To the point of all the dancers that enter the Vaganova school have to pass a very thorough physical examination, make sure that they have the physical ability and capability to go through the Vaganova method because yeah. it is very, very difficult, very demanding. And it's not for everybody. The students that enter the Vaganova Academy in Russia have to have pre existing beautiful turnout, mm -hmm. hyperextended legs, crazy ranges of flexibility in mm -hmm. every regard. Yeah. This is all because if you don't have that to begin with, you'll you will struggle very much with this training method. Vaganova had a very strong idea that the culmination and the ultimate test of a dancer's skill and training mm -hmm. was their ability to perform a full length pas de deux. So a grand pas de deux, entry, adagio, solo, solo, coda. That's kind of like the ultimate test of a dancer in mm -hmm. her eyes. And so every single combination in her class was to prepare a dancer in terms of technique and also the stamina to eventually be able to perform a grand pas de deux. So all of her combinations are very, very long, very, very thorough. Yes. And a lot of the time they sample passages from famous potters. So some trademark Vaganova things, definitely the arms are much more dramatic and extended, expressive than the past three styles that we've talked about so far. Definitely every style up until this point was much more demure, much more Place. forward, much more placed. Vaganova, here we have Vaganova with this extremely, <laughs> extremely expressive and extravagant port de bras. Very, very grand and so open comparatively. Mm -hmm. I think emphasis on high extensions yeah. and flexibility is a must for Vaganova dancers. From the very beginning, Vaganova prioritized a very, very supple lower back. She believed that the back should be involved with every single movement. And the only way to achieve that is to have a lot of mobility in the spine itself. So the dancers had to stretch 
a lot. If you ever see the dancers in the Baganova Academy, you can see them doing like all the gymnastics things and their backs like bend in half. Yeah. <laughs> Baganova has a really strong emphasis on this like perfect profile line. Yeah, meaning turning the head all the way to the side. I don't even know if I can do that. More than More this. More than that even. Like, it has to be perfectly to the side and usually way, way back. back. Here. The yeah. whole purpose of that was to have the line of the head and the cheek and the neck follow one line and it just made a very open and elongated position. Additionally, we have to address the classic Russian fouette. I'm pretty sure the entire world does fouettes with the leg coming to the front. As you releve, the leg is carried to the side and then you mm -hmm. pull in and do the fouette. Russian is very different. You skip the front altogether mm -hmm. and you go directly to the side and, and then pull you pull it, it in. in. And also when your leg is to the side, you're in a plie. So it had a little more of a accent down mm -hmm. rather than an up in and up in it's, it's just down, down and down, down and up and down and up yeah so it has a different rhythm it's yeah a completely different look it is well. a different look i guess another thing you can note is their attitude line mm -hmm. is a much more lengthened as everything is with Vaganova. Very much lengthened and more open position. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very beautiful position. I just think it looks bigger and grander. And I mean, that was the point of Vaganova. Yeah. She wanted everything to look very big and expressive. Personally, I like it. So where can we find some beautiful Russian trained dancers? Marinsky and Bolshoi is the first way to go. There are a lot of Russian dancers that are also around the globe. Like yeah. Olga Smirnova, mm -hmm. I believe she's with Dutch National Ballet now. Natalia Makara, was mm -hmm. Russian trained. Natalia Asapova, Svetlana Zakharova, Diana Vishneva. <laughs> They're very, very popular and well known. I'm sure that if you could just look on your home screen after watching our video, you'll find some. <laughs> <laughs> the Vaganova style is the most acclaimed yeah. style. And it seems to have like set the standard for ballet. In a way. In a way. Just because it's so big and it's so impressive and it's just captivating to watch, you know? Vaganova is definitely the popular girl of the ballet oh, yeah, styles. For sure. Everybody loves her. She's pretty glam, pretty dramatic. Yeah, very dramatic. Everybody adores her, but she's also very selective with very her friends. Very choosy. Very choosy with her friends. Yeah. So if you are lucky enough to know Vaganova, consider yourself blessed. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the English style, more specifically the uh, Royal Academy of Dance or RAD style. The board of RAD was established in 1920. Pretty recent comparatively to like 1661. <laughs> <laughs> RAD is sort of a big melting pot of like Italian, like Cicchetti, some French, some Danish. Even a little bit of Vagano, like Vagano. a little bit Russian in there as yeah. well. They took a blend of everything and were like, you know, let's, let's, let's put our it all own. together. Mm -hmm. And then that's the RAD style. They add a lot of free movement as yeah. they call it so it's not just ballet training so that the students have a chance to actually move and learn how to feel the music in the space instead of just working on classwork yeah. until you have to perform. RAD's training method features one set of exercises and you repeat that every day for the entire semester so you learn your bar exercises in your center and you do that every single day it's just like your daily vitamins and that's for a few reasons and that is the purpose of having a certain step mastered before moving on to anything more difficult. I feel like it's a very calculated training method. It's really perfectionistic. It has to, everything has to be so, 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 so perfect and analyzed down to like the smallest, smallest details. And then at the very end of the year, all the students have to go through an RAD exam with an RAD certified board member, which is terrifying. It's scary. <laughs> but that just ensures that the dance actually mastered the techniques of that particular syllabus and they're ready to move on to the next level. One thing that really stands out to me about the RAD style particularly is mm -hmm. how no frills it is. Extremely academic to the point of where, you know, when you have to open your arm to second and then take it down, usually you would have an allonge. You can't see, I'll do it. <laughs> which means you lengthen and turn the palms down and then you float the fingers down. In RAD, they have like where the, you just take the arm down or if anything, you just turn the wrist and you come down. There's no breath, there's no nothing. It's very strict in that yeah. way. And I think it's a good way to start so that the children don't pick up any weird affectations or something, yeah. thinking that they're gonna try and be a ballerina and they do yeah. this like, weird thing. Yeah. I, I guess it's subjective. You could also very easily just kill someone's artistry. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but that's why they balance it with free movement. I think that's why yeah. they have to incorporate that so you don't lose 
the that artistry all together. But they wanted to make sure each was developed separately. So technique is technique and then artistry is artistry. And then right. when you get to like the higher levels, you eventually put them together. We'll have a little bit more freedom to make it look like ballet. I like the RAD training because they have two routes, I guess. We'll make this a small point, but you have two routes, the recreational route, and then they also have a vocational or more serious, like people who want to go pro mm -hmm. route. Yeah. You put the dancers, depending on their goals, you start off the same, like you go grade one, two, and three, and four. And then after that, you have a split off for like people who aren't going to take ballet like as a professional career. They'll go on the recreational route, which is five, six, seven, and eight. And then if you're going on a professional vocational route then you'll go into intermediate foundations intermediate and then advanced found and then advanced one and then advanced two I think there's another graduate level. Yeah, I think there, there, might, there be. might be another even graduate level. RAD also sort of follows the Chiquetti way in terms of they don't force you to have a complete 180 degree yeah, you know. yeah, not in an unhealthy way. Of course, they'll make you improve it in a very healthy and sustainable way. Mm -hmm. Again, more putting health first, I think, is one of the priorities. I think another quality that you can see from like RAD trained dancers, like once they graduate, obviously, you can really see the cleanliness from the previous training come through. <laughs> Everything's very placed. Everything is very technically sound. They're strong dancers. Yeah, honestly, they're just they're just they're just wonderful to watch. A lot of the royal ballet dancers are RAD trained, or at least started in like RAD schools before joining the royal ballet school. Mm -hmm. And it speaks for itself. It speaks for itself. It's a very methodical training method, and when done right, it can really produce some beautiful dancers. RAD just gives like the mom friend for me. Yeah, absolutely. She like carries a day planner with her. Yeah. She's very orderly, keeps everybody in check. Dependable, responsible person. Yeah. Like, I feel like she's a little bit perfectionistic. Oh. Oh, very sure. particular, but she's also very warm and friendly and open to everybody. This might be the most recent, or one of the most recent training methods. This is, of course, the Balanchine training method. This one is also quite different than a lot of the other training methods. There's a lot of differences in terms of like the, the characteristics of this training style. So starting with obviously the facts, founded by George Balanchine, who was a Russian trained dancer. I think he originally did dance with the Marinsky for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then when he came to America, he founded School of American Ballet, or SAB. And he even founded his own company, the New York City Ballet. He eventually gained the title, the father of American ballet, kind of a big title, and he kind of revolutionized the ballet technique. And his focus is, of course, to take up more space in less time. So again, another one of those bigger is bigger, grander is grander. More is more. More is more mentality. Yeah. Kind of like Vaganova, but like Balanchine. Obviously because of his Russian training, you can see a little bit of that influence coming into his training yeah. method. The defining characteristics of the Balanchine training and- There are so many defining characteristics so of the Balanchine. So many. First off, I guess, is just the overall look and the vibe. I think the Balanchine training is definitely like a Russian training, but more athletic and more contemporary modern-ish. It's not that it's not ballet anymore, like not it's not a contemporary style, but it just looks newer. Balanchine dancers are known for their extreme speed. Balanchine was known to push the speed. If you look at mm -hmm. any of his ballets, chances are you're gonna have some crazy fast choreography in there. That was kind of the way to making ballet big in America, was just that supersonic speed <laughs> like that virtuosic effect and that was obviously achieved by really really pushing the speed and making it look like I don't know how a human is even able to do that that kind of effect also they're pirouettes pirouettes on the or usually you'd start from a fourth position in plie mm -hmm. both neither bent yeah. Balanchine was like oh we're not gonna do this you know what we'll do we'll straighten the back leg because he thought it made a more elongated line Balanchine did like the elongated shapes and so all the Balanchine dancers if you watch them do their pirouettes the back leg is straight and it's an it's very long an arabesque. An arabesque position. How could we forget the Balanchine Claw? The Balanchine Claw! I can't do it right. The Balanchine training calls for a much more rounded hand position. In most other styles, the fingers are much more lengthened and the thumb is also kind of tucked in, but it's the whole line is very much streamlined and very lengthened. But in the Balanchine training, he wanted the palm to be cupped. The thumb <laughs> is away from the fingers and all fingers separated. So you can see every So you can finger. see every single finger. I can't do it right, I'm not balancing training. But <laughs> we'll put up some footage here. They even have students hold like golf balls in their hands to train that sort of round cupped palm shape. 
when they're doing their classes. That's crazy. From the back of the theater, you can still see their fingers, so... It worked. It worked. Yeah. Another balancing turning thing is yeah. that whenever they're doing turns across the floor, like on a diagonal across the floor, uh -huh. most ballet styles you will spot the corner or wherever your direction you're headed. Not so for balancing. He preferred the dancers to spot front, so you yes. keep connecting with the audience. Oh my god. As you're going, it's so hard to do. It's, it's so, so hard. hard. <laughs> there are so many balancing quirks. Quirks and differences. Like the arms, out of all the styles, I feel like the balancing is the most elongated. Like yeah. in their second position, it's not a rounded position. It's like pretty much straight. And then the wrists are broken at the end. Same thing with their fifth position. It's very tall. It's a very tall position rather than like rounded. Yeah. It's very tall with the wrists, like, broken, yeah. as they say. Also, he liked the open arabesque line, so instead of being very square, he preferred that, that. feel. Because it just adds energy and extension. Yeah. It does make a very big presence mm -hmm. on stage when you yeah. have that open line. Also, for balancing, like, when you're going through the middle, mm. from first to fifth, you would never just go like this. They always have, like, the this cross situation. Ribs. I'm guessing aerodynamics so you can move faster that's a very good hypothesis just like a random guess i do say i love the balancing dancers musicality so good because they're never Matches. struggling to keep to catch up to music yeah so they're never late mm -hmm. it's that sort of athleticism yeah. and they're just like they can attack each step mm -hmm. on the music mm -hmm. it's so satisfying to watch balancing dancer because so you will know for a fact that they yeah. will they will be mm -hmm. on the music at any given time the other thing about balancing this is a very trademark balancing thing their attitude line they prefer to have it at a right angle for a lot of the time in the Russian training is very much open, mm -hmm. but in Balanchine, it's shortened. Yeah. Quite a bit. Aerodynamics. <laughs> Balanchine dancers also major in trick steps. Oh. Like if you if you want to see strong, solid fuetes oh, and like incredible feats of humanity, yeah, you should watch Balanchine. They're all turners and they're all jumpers. They're all everything, yeah. really. All the trick steps. Yeah. And like being able to balance as well. It, it's <laughs> crazy. It's crazy actually. The stuff that they can do is actually insane. Yeah. If you want to watch some Balanchine ballet, it's obviously New York City Ballet. The obviously. origin of Balanchine. But also there are a lot of Balanchine companies. I think P and B. Yeah, is Pacific one of them. Northwest. Miami City. And also Balanchine's ballet that performed everywhere. Balanchine's like, ballets are very popular. Yeah, you can see jewels at the Marinsky. You can see, yeah. you know, Serenade anywhere else. <laughs> like, yeah. Of course, it's Balanchine dancers that you will all know and recognize and love. Sarah Mearns, Tyler Peck, Ashley Bowder, yes. all of those amazing, beautiful dancers. They're all so fabulous yes. at what they do, and they honestly look like they enjoy themselves every mm -hmm. single time. The Balanchine style, I'd say, is that kind of friend where you would go for a 3 a.m. snack run down the highway with the windows down with Stravinsky on full blast. Like, that yeah. kind of thing. A very spontaneous person, probably the most entertaining, charismatic person you'll ever meet. For and sure. The one that, you know, everyone just like, just hangs out with. Yeah, cool. everyone gravitates towards this person. That's so. Balanchine. That's Balanchine. And that also concludes our classical ballet friend group. <laughs> Well, there you have it. Those are all of the different little ballet style characters that we got to introduce you today. Obviously, there are a lot of other techniques and mm -hmm. training methods and styles out there. This is the tip of the iceberg, but these are these are the most well-known and kind of like the core pillars of the classical ballet styles. We hope you enjoyed learning about these different styles and hopefully you'll be able to recognize your favorite ballet dancer's training method and recognize and appreciate all the unique styles of all the ballets out there. Sort of disclaimer for the end. These styles are definitely not solid, hard boxes. A lot of them were also trained in multiple styles, too. That's true. So. Whenever you watch a dancer, just know you're probably seeing a very unique blend mm -hmm. of that dancer's entire training and all the different influences that were poured into them. If you like the video, then like the video and please leave a comment which style you like the best, which you like to dance, which you like to watch, because we're very curious to know which styles speak to you the most and what qualities you love. So leave your preferences in the comments, we'll be happy to read them. And maybe Make sure you share this video to spread the good ballet nerd vibes. If you would like some more nerdy ballet content, may we kindly direct you towards the playlist <laughs> that we have above and below if you would like to learn more about ballet and level up your ballet nerding skills. Of course, if you want to see more of these videos and you haven't subscribed to the channel already, the <laughs> red button is down there at your disposal. Do with it what you will. Anyway, I think that is all from us for now. This is Ballet Rain signing off. Until the next video. Bye.
Ladies and gentlemen, ah! <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs>